Hello, everyone. Welcome to the live session for today. Uh, what is this? November 15th, 2023. We are excited to be here. Uh, my name is Matthew. I'm one of the course staff. I work behind the scenes. Um, and uh, the way this works, if you're new to us or new to one of these sessions, please post your astronomy related questions uh, in the chat and we will grab them from there. Um, we try to go in order, but I jump around to try and get a variety of topics and uh, to give a variety of people a chance to ask questions. Um, also, we want to um, invite you to email. Um, you can look in the chat window, there's an email if you'd rather do that. Uh, like and subscribe to our channel. Make sure you click that bell icon so that you get notifications uh, every time we have one of these live sessions. I'm gonna hand this over to Chris um, and uh, you can welcome everyone and then we'll get started with your questions from that chat. Okay, hello everyone. Have you found the session from one of our MOOCs or just stumbled upon the website or the channel? Um, welcome and I'm ready to answer questions about astronomy. The first question today is from David Wismer uh, who's on with us live. Uh, David asks, what is the impact of the expanding universe on the Higgs field? In the future, when the universe has doubled in size, will matter have half as much mass? Um, that's a good question. Um, the Higgs field is not directly implicated in vacuum energy, which is the mechanism by which space-time is expanding at an accelerating rate. Uh, and actually, the physical mechanism for the Higgs field is independent of the expansion of the universe. Uh, so no, the mass of particles within the expanding space-time will not actually change as the universe expands because the mechanism that's causing the space-time to expand is, is different uh, from the field that gives rise to the mass of particles. Uh, the next question is from Ahmed Mead, who asks, uh, what are the leading theories and observational evidence supporting the existence of dark matter and dark energies? The leading observations for dark matter are legion. There's an enormous number of observations over almost half a century showing that galaxies, spiral galaxies, rotate faster than can be explained by the visible matter. And elliptical galaxies have stellar motions fast faster than it can be explained by the visible stars. Um, so they need to be held together by dark matter, which outweighs the normal matter by a factor of five or six. Um, and there's dark matter evidence in other ways, especially from lensing. Lensing where mass bends light, according to general relativity, uh, lensing is sensitive to all forms of mass, dark or light, and so it's a good way to weigh the universe in different scales, especially between the scales of galaxies, the largest objects like clusters, or individual galaxies. Always dark matter is seen. Dark energy has less evidence to support it. It has only really the accelerating expansion that was first detected in the mid-1990s, and that's been confirmed many times since, so we, we don't doubt that observation. But that's really all we have as evidence for dark energy. And the theoretical uh, explanations, uh, basically to be short, because it's a long subject, it's a big subject, um, they're not yet decided. The most likely candidate for dark matter is a subatomic fundamental particle, yet to be discovered, yet to be detected. A few are predicted. And the most likely ca candidate for dark energy is essentially unknown, because there are many physical ideas. Some are easy to test, some are hard to test. There's very little reason to choose between them, and so uh, theorists are really struggling to explain dark energy. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is also from one of our live mm -hmm. participants. Uh, let me just paste this in here. Um, Geoblitz asks, how might a successful theory of quantum gravity impact our current understanding of black holes? A quantum theory of gravity would presumably resolve some of the issues we have with black holes. Um, the information paradox is one of them, the idea that information appears to be lost when a material crosses the event horizon, uh, and that conflicts with the quantum mechanics principles. So quantized gravity, quantum theory of gravity would presumably resolve that. 
and it would resolve the whole issue of the firewall of how you explain uh, quantum effects across the event horizon, which you tend to have to use a, a firewall type explanation to destroy the coherent information across the event horizon. A quantum theory of black holes would also presumably naturally explain uh, Hawking radiation, the prediction that black holes radiate and evaporate, uh, and it would probably give a more profound understanding of the interior of a black hole, of is there, is there really a singularity, and are there possible connections to other pieces of space-time, the idea of white holes. So a quantum theory of gravity would move us quite a ways forward with black holes. The next question is from Nita Frank, who's on with us live. What causes the forward thrust in any orbit to counteract, to counteract gravity? The forward thrust or motion in an orbit uh, that counteracts the gravity pulling the object inwards is basically a balance of forces. And the origin of that forward momentum, if you like, uh, comes from the initial conditions. So for example, when the solar system formed, the nebulous cloud of gas and dust that formed the solar system had some degree of rotation, had angular momentum. So it had angular momentum going in. And when the system collapsed into a disk and formed objects, the angular momentum is conserved, simple law of physics. And so the regions where the planets were going to form had angular momentum from the original system, and that gives them their forward motion when the planets are in their orbits. And then the balance that's achieved in the orbit is a balance between gravitational potential energy towards the center of the system, which in this case would be the sun, and a kinetic energy of motion in the orbit, which is the orbital velocity. Uh, the next question is from Christine Richards, who sent an email. Uh, Christine asks, do you think it's possible for us to evolve into a more advanced civilization without first handling problems on Earth like uh, inter sort of personal problems, uh, social problems like racism or white supremacy. Um, do you think uh, that those, you know, solving those problems uh, is necessary before we can solve our own planetary issues and, you know, move into the solar system? I'm afraid I believe the answer is yes, that we need to mature as a civilization if we are to survive as a civilization. It's, that's a fairly dramatic, draconian way to put it, but it seems to be what the evidence is around us. Uh, we are very immature. We are tribal. Uh, we are if apes not yet fully evolved, if however you want to put it. Um, and so we have technology. We have the powers of computers and space travel and now artificial intelligence. Um, but we also live on a planet that's rife with war and conflict and prejudice between different peoples and different religions. Um, and, you know, the world is not going to be a safe or better place regardless of those technologies and that advancement. Um, and so there's no way around it, but I, it's hard to imagine how you can have a stable, long-lived civilization without our overcoming the social conflicts that we see around us. Um, and she also would, was interested, do you, have, do you have any idea if there are any follow-up readings about that kind of concept, either um, um, nonfiction or fiction um, that cover those kinds of things? Uh, if not, then we can move on to the next question. Uh, nothing obvious comes to mind. I would generally, however, recommend um, there's, there's one, one writer in particular who deals with a lot of the issues of the future uh, in a very plausible way. He knows the science, and that's Kim Stanley Robinson. He's written books about terraforming Mars and about the environmental futures of the Earth and how we might survive in the future. Some of his books are quite dark and pessimistic, and uh, Ministry of the Future is a recent one. It's a little more optimistic. So that's the book that I would recommend, or the author I would recommend, who uh, can straddle the worlds of science fiction and the science of climate change and evolution of civilizations. Thank you very much. That's a great recommendation. Uh, Lawrence Kay, who's on with us live, asks, a high professor, is energy conserved in an expanding universe? Is dark energy an inherent property of space-time? Yes, there is a conservation of energy principle that applies in the expanding universe. The expanding universe uh, clearly has some propulsive force, some kinetic energy of expansion, energy of motion, 
of objects within the expanding space-time, but it also has gravitational potential energy because the objects within it are all pulling on each other towards a common center, uh, each pulling in every direction, and that's gravitational potential energy. So that kinetic energy and that potential energy are essentially equal, so the total energy is constant. Uh, dark energy is a wild card in this formalism because while uh, dark energy actually is a constant, so as space-time expands, the amount of dark energy or its strength uh, does not change. Uh, and that's an interesting phenomenon. And that's what leads to the pressure that dark energy causes that makes space-time expand. So dark energy is an extra ingredient that does not obey that conservation of energy that regards the motion itself. Uh, the next question is from Sarab, who asks, uh, thank you for the session. I want to, I'd like to have your insights on mm -hmm. a magnetic study of meteorites. Uh, what do you think could be the most probable reason for a meteorite to possess a magnetic field? Um, magnetized uh, material or magnetically sensitive material is not uncommon in geology. Um, a magnetite was the original form of this that was discovered in ancient Earth by uh, ancient civilizations actually created compasses out of lodestones, which were just magnetized rocks. So magnetized rocks form naturally in space and, and as part of planetary and lunar bodies. Um, the cause of the magnetic field is that it's a primordial magnetic field. The magnetic field of the sun and of the planets was present in the initial conditions of the expanding gas cloud. So there are weak, uh, ambient, chaotic magnetic fields that can exist in space and in regions of matter and radiation, uh, and that's because there are charged particles. So anywhere there are charged particles, there are the possibility of electrical fields and associated magnetic fields. And then when a physical object is formed, it tends to entrain the magnetic field or, or trap it. And that's also true of the sun, which as it collapsed, entrained or trapped and then concentrated as it formed a smaller object, the magnetic field that forms the sun's magnetic field, which has a cycle of 22 years. Uh, physical objects like down to the size of asteroids, comets, moons, and planets similarly can entrain magnetic field that was present in the region they formed, uh, and it will be trapped within the rocky material. Not all the rocks are equally sensitive to magnetic domains, so they, they don't manifest the magnetic field unless they have certain uh, magnetic, uh, geomagnetic properties. Excellent. The next question is from Mary McGrant, who sent an email. Regarding the impactor theory of our moon's formation, might it be possible to detect where the impactor crashed into the Earth uh, by finding some kind of differential makeup of the Earth's surface. Uh, she's, and she recognizes that the land masses are relatively young, um, but might there be a deeper layer of material um, that's uh, further inside the Earth? Finding uh, physical evidence of the impactor that caused the moon to form very soon after the Earth's formation Unfortunately, it's unlikely there's any direct physical evidence, and that's just because the moon is, the Earth is such a restless planet. So when the impact occurred, the moon was still in a semi-molten state, a magma state, and the impact splashed off mantle material. That mantle material has since shifted and moved around, because remember there's tectonic activity, which is slow, convective, circulating patterns within the essentially semi-molten rock, and that mixes the rock extensively, and that's been going on for four billion years, as, as the Earth has been an active planet. Um, and so that, plus the movements of the crust and the continental plates shifting around in the last half billion years, means there's no residue, there's no traces of the physical morphology of the Earth from the soon after its formation. Everything has changed. The next question is from Pakornan, who's on with us live. Why is there an upper limit to speed and not for other things like temperature or gravity? That's a good question. So why, why is speed special in this regard? Um, it's built into the theory of special relativity. Um, 
uh, that speed is special. And it's really also associated with the theory of light, the electromagnetic radiation theory, or Maxwell's equations. Um, so Maxwell's equations uh, hold that light and other forms of radiation are coupled electric and magnetic oscillations. And in the theory, a uh, speed drops out that is 300,000 kilometers per second in a vacuum, the speed of light, or radio waves, or x-rays. Um, so that's just part of the theory that electromagnetic radiation has a particular speed. The fact that it's a speed limit comes out of relativity too, because if you try to accelerate a physical object, as opposed to a, a wave or, or radiation itself, to anything like the speed of light, you have to end up putting so much energy into it that it never reaches that speed. And so that's the speed limit of light that, that limits what you can do with physical matter. Uh, other things don't have the same type of physical limit. Temperature uh, is unlimited just because you can keep putting more and more energy into a system, and there's no physical law that stops you from doing that endlessly. Um, there are, however, limits in the other direction to density, uh, because the maximum density you can conceive of in physics is the density that corresponds to a black hole of a particular mass. So density is something that does have an upper limit, too. So there are physical quantities with upper limits, like density and speed of light, and some with no upper limit, uh, such as uh, distance, for example. There's no physical limit to distance in the universe or in actual practice or in theory, and temperature. Excellent. Um, Kenise, who's on with us live, asks, uh, hi, Professor Impey. There are some theories that Andromeda and that Andromeda, the Andromeda galaxy, and the Milky Way galaxy will combine in some billions or trillions of years. So will this have any impact on Earth? Uh, <clears throat> the Milky Way and Andromeda are approaching at about 100 kilometers per second. Uh, and if you do the math of the separation, which is about two and a quarter billion million light years, then the collision or the approach will take place in not trillions, but in about three or three and a half billion years. So actually before the sun dies as a star, so there could indeed be life on Earth that is able to witness this event. Now, it's not a direct head-on collision, as well as we can tell. The, the, the vector of the collision is not very accurately determined, but it doesn't seem to be a head-on collision. So what's happening is that the two galaxies will approach each other, they will pass each other, overshoot, and swing back, and they will do this sort of oscillating uh, settling where the nuclei of the two galaxies merge. Meanwhile, the extended parts of the galaxies, the places where most of the stars are in the spiral arms, will be subject to long-range gravitational tidal forces. And that means they will not typically collide as the two galaxies merge and combine. Uh, stars will stay intact, but they will be heavily influenced by the other galaxy. And so stars will be distorted from their current orbits and thrown into big loops and whorls in intergalactic space so that they extend much further from the center of the galaxy than they do now. And that's a possible fate for the solar system, the Earth, and all the planets around the sun. The Earths and the planets will not be stripped away from the sun by this process. It's a long-range process, so it doesn't spell the end of the Earth because the sun will still be intact and still in its life. Um, and there's no likely direct collisions to result of this merger. So this is indeed something that the Earth and humans or anyone on the Earth will be able to survive and actually witness. The next question is from Wendy Traver, who sent an email. How would our world be different, or would it even exist without quantum entanglement that seems to be a fundamental property of the universe? It's always interesting to ask uh, hypotheticals or counterfactuals in science. It's one of the ways physics has proceeded for 100 years. Um, and so the question of whether the universe or the world as we know it would be different if quantum entanglement did not exist, was not a phenomenon of physics, is an interesting one. It does seem to be built into the theory of quantum mechanics. It does seem to be a part of nature. Um, what it is saying, really, is that physics is non-local because entanglement means instantaneous communication of quantum information across a finite distance, which is against relativity. So it's beating against relativity in some sense. Um, what does it imply if that didn't exist? 
uh, quantum entanglement is not manifested very naturally in the world. It doesn't just occur in nature, uh, as far as we know. And so in that sense, the universe would not be very different if quantum entanglement were not possible or didn't exist. The next question is from Nita, who's on with us live. Is the best chance of finding evidence of life on Europa to look at the cracks where creatures from internal water or microbes may have emerged and frozen? Yes, the, the, the ice sheet is, is heavily fractured. We've seen from orbiter images back to the 1970s um, that Europa has a, a fractured ice sheet. And we've learned more recently from seismic and geomagnetic evidence that the ice sheet is moving, it's shifting, it's, it's cracking and it's flexing and it's breaking apart. And there's upwelling of water from the subsurface ocean through the ice layer where it will refreeze. And indeed, it could carry microbes from the subsurface ocean and then refreeze. So that's bringing potential evidence for life much closer to the surface than it would otherwise be if life only exists in the subsurface ocean. Uh, so the cracks are indeed a very fruitful, promising place to explore. And so if there were ever a lander, now the uh, Europa Clipper, which is planned and it's going to launch, I think, late next year, um, is going to be an orbiter, and it may have a splash experiment that splashes off some of the ice and analyzes it, but we don't have a lander plan. But if there were a lander, yes, one of the recently fractured or active crack regions would be the best place to land. The next question is from GeoBlitz, who is on with us live. Uh, can you explain the concept of a Dyson sphere and what technological advancements would be required to build one? So the Dyson sphere idea is named after Freeman Dyson, a famous physicist who spent most of his career at the Institute for Advanced Studies uh, in Princeton. Um, the idea is an energy trapping sphere that is built by an advanced civilization that is unhappy or unsatisfied with the small fraction of stellar radiation they receive. So the Earth intercepts about a billionth of the sun's light, and we only utilize a small fraction of that. So we are using a tiny fraction of the sun's energy. Sun radiates in all directions. And a Dyson sphere is an attempt to dramatically change that situation by putting a, a sphere in place with, that, with some energy capturing uh, mechanism could trap a good fraction of the entire radiation rather than a tiny fraction by surrounding the star at some distance where the material would not melt. So it's a pretty big object. It's not a solid object because uh, rotation stresses and internal stresses would make that impossible. Um, it would almost certainly have to be a rotating object given the sun's angular momentum. Um, so it would be, it's going to be a loose lattice structure, and that means it's not trapping all the energy. But some significant fraction, maybe a few percent, which is a billion times better than you're doing now. Um, could a civilization build it? What would it take to build it? Well, it's obviously hugely uh, ambitious because the sun is 150 million kilometers away. So you'd have to do a, an enormous construction project, truly enormous, but outsized any terrestrial construction project by orders of magnitude around the whole sun to build that and then develop the technology to convert the trapped radiation into probably microwaves that you could then beam back to the earth so you could use them. And these are all technologies and capabilities are very far beyond us currently. And so we imagine a Dyson sphere is only something that a very advanced civilization that is thousands, maybe tens of thousands or more years more advanced than us could manage. Uh, the next question is from uh, Ravi, uh, who sent an email. Uh, can you, um, are there interesting objects other than black holes that can be imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope? Um, yes, the Event Horizon Telescope is a uh, radio telescope, a sort of millimeter wave telescope. Um, those are short radio wavelengths, actually, uh, somewhere you know in the range between the far infrared and the classic radio wavelengths. So it's a radio telescope. It's a radio interferometer able to make extremely fine angular resolution images of any source of radio waves. Um, looking at the 
the material, the hot material around a black hole and that looking for the shadowing of the event horizon is a very spectacular use of the event horizon telescope and obviously gives it its name and was its primary purpose and was the result of two huge successes in the last couple of years. But it's not the only thing that telescope can do and it's not the only thing that telescope does routinely. It's doing radio astronomy. It's looking at small compact radio sources. Pulsars would be another good target. Uh, the central black holes of large galaxies, uh, the active regions of those black holes as opposed to the black holes themselves is another possibility. Um, so the Event Horizon Telescope is doing a good range of radio astronomy. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from uh, Mary, who uh, sent an email. Um, I find the explanation of the frost line in the solar system confusing. I fail to see how temperature is important. It seems to me that the pressure of protostellar wind would be the important factor um, with uh, planet formation, um, not the freezing temperature. So there's a complicated set of things going on when planets uh, and objects form in a solar system. Uh, the initial star, the sun, if it was a, is the sun is a sun-like star, and we're talking about sun-like systems, is much more luminous than the current sun. It goes through a T-Tauri phase. So there's an enormous amount of radiation, and that radiation pressure does indeed drive a lot of the gas from the system. But the business of whether a, a planet or a smaller body is primarily icy or potentially watery or baked dry does indeed allude to the water line and the frost line. So the frost line is the distance from the star once it's stabilized and settled down where uh, normal volatiles such as carbon dioxide or water go into the solid state. Um, and there are other volatiles, of course, methane. You know, there, there's a series of small molecules that are called volatiles that have liquid, gaseous, and solid phases. Um, so the frost line is a reasonable place to define where the edge of the habitable zone, for example, is, where primordial rocks will retain their original ices, where the ices will not have been burned off by radiation pressure or heat. Um, and so it's a useful concept for talking about objects in the later solar system, uh, whether they were born beyond the frost line or inside the frost line. Interior objects, far interior objects, tend to be mostly baked dry. The next question is from Karen, who's on with us live. Given that there is an observation horizon beyond which we cannot see, as the light has not arrived here yet, how can we know that if the universe is infinite or finite? Uh, we actually don't know because of that. So we have a strictly observational bound on what we can see called the horizon. Uh, there are different, astronomers have slightly different definitions of the word horizon. But the horizon we're talking about here is the horizon or the edge of vision defined by a distance from which light can have reached us in 13.8 billion years, the age of the universe. Uh, and so we can say nothing about regions of space-time beyond that. Uh, but we have no reason to believe they don't exist. In fact, we have reason to believe they do exist because the universe was expanding faster than light speed early on. Uh, it was superluminal, and that means that it is almost certain that there are regions uh, beyond our visible horizon where we have not yet seen, but if we wait long enough, we will see them. And so it's a very practical definition of the size of the universe. Excellent. The next question is from one of our live participants. Uh, sir, in the book Living Cosmos, you talk about astrobiology as a new and emerging um, uh, sub-discipline in astronomy. Are there any other new emerging uh, sub-disciplines uh, that you uh, would like to write a book about? I'm not sure there's one that I'm ready to write a book about. Astrobiology is, is one of the most dynamic and, um, and biggest subfields of astronomy, if you like. But there are other subfields. Astrochemistry is a sort of related field. Uh, it doesn't care particularly about whether 
uh, there's life in the universe necessary, but it's asking in a universe where most of the universe is made of simple uh, elements on their own, hydrogen and helium, uh, and then a very small number of heavy elements, it's asking what the chemical properties of the universe is. Uh, and there are now ov over 120, I think, maybe 130 molecules that have been detected in space in different regions with molecular weights or numbers of atoms in them going up to 20 or 25 or 30. And there's complex chemical interactions between them. So astrochemistry is certainly another field, uh, not quite as big and as dynamic as astrobiology, but a substantial subfield of astronomy that's very active. Uh, the next question is from <clears throat> GeoBlitz, who's on with us live. What are the primary challenges and potential solutions for achieving interstellar travel within the next century? For interstellar travel, uh, we need new energy sources. We need new propulsion mechanisms. As impressive as what's happening in the space program with uh, Blue Origin and SpaceX um, is, it's based on chemical rockets. It's based on the same rockets that Robert Goddard invented in 1928, so 100 years ago. It hasn't really changed. They're just expensive. They're very efficient cousins of the Saturn V rocket that got astronauts to the moon over 50 years ago. In that sense, we haven't progressed. So how might we go in another 100 years? Well, it's taken us 100 years, and we're still working with chemical rockets, so we obviously have to do something different and uh, we have to find new energy sources. The obvious more efficient energy source to look at is fission or fusion. Um, and fusion is, is a more promising one. Um, but there are technologies that are not yet being prototyped on the Earth that would have to be scaled up and tested in space. And that's a difficult and expensive program. And the amount of investment on that is really low. So the conundrum is that the private space program is doing very well, building a new business. I think the private space sector this year and worldwide is going to be about half a trillion dollars. That's quite substantial. Um, so it's doing very well, relying on uh, chemical rockets. There's no real incentive for them to sink enormous amounts into research and development on new propulsion systems. So we sit in that interesting space where there's no incentive for the main players right now in space especially the private ones, to invest in new technologies that might get us to the stars. And they don't have a business model of what we would do when we go to the stars. And that sort of, to me, is pushing off interstellar travel to well beyond a century. The next question is from Michael Serrera, who asks, I just recently learned about the robotic drill used to pop space shuttle tires during testing. Are there any other creative or uh, astounding solutions to odd problems that NASA has found or had to come up with? Well, NASA's sort of, you know, always having to think on its feet because when something goes wrong, um, you know, you essentially have to improvise and you don't have a lot to improvise with. Uh, that example for the tires and, the, and an, uh, using an existing tool is an example where you have a toolkit, the astronauts. Uh, basically have toolkits on spacecraft and the International Space Station has a pretty extensive set of tools and that's all you've got. I mean, so you have to solve a problem with what you have. As we know, the Apollo 13 near disaster where astronauts were almost lost was solved by with something as simple as duct tape and pieces of plastic. It will, didn't use anything very high technology nor any very advanced instruments. Um, so I think NASA's had a series of problems where they've fixed things with sealing wax, string, and duct tape, basically, and even literally, uh, and ha without re recourse to more technologically savvy solutions because you simply don't have those capabilities in space. The next question is from Miles Zitmore, who sent an email. Uh, what do we know about the rates of star extinction versus creation of new stars? Is there some balance between the two? And then here's the reason why <clears throat> they're asking. Um, if our sun will use up its fuel and other stars use up their fuel concurrently, uh, will some future observer be looking up at a largely dark sky or will that sky simply be populated with newly created stars? So it's a good question and the simple answer is there is a, a short-term 
current balance between star formation and destruction in the Milky Way. Milky Way is an active galaxy or actively star forming galaxy with stars being formed from gas and dust. But this loop is not perfect and it's heading in one direction which is the gradual demise of star formation. And, and the reason is pretty clear. Uh, there's an existing reservoir of gas and dust to make new stars and that gradually gets used up. And the only way it's replenished is late in a star's life when it ejects some of its material. In the sun's case, it will be as a red giant or planetary nebula. Uh, but stars, as they die, only eject a fraction of their mass. In the sun's case, it will be maybe about a third of its mass, leaving behind a white dwarf that's about 60% of the sun's mass. And the same is true of all stars. So they only recycle a fraction of their material to form new stars, and the rest of the material is locked into a stellar remnant, and that's material is trapped forever as a white dwarf, neutron star, or black hole. And so playing that forward into the future, you will gradually run out of material to make new stars because a larger and larger fraction of all the material will be trapped in stellar remnants, compact stellar remnants. Um, and in the end, the result of that will be that the universe does indeed go dark as no new stars form. The next qu question is from Kaniz Fatima who asks, uh, Professor, I am new to astronomy, so can you talk a little bit about what is dark energy? Dark energy is a uh, something, a physical entity that we don't fully understand and don't have a good theory of, that is causing space-time to expand faster and faster. So we live in an expanding universe. In the 1990s, we discovered that the expansion rate is increasing and has been increasing for the last few billion years. Uh, and the active agent causing that accelerating expansion has been called dark energy. But that phrase is not really a physical explanation. It's just a placeholder, if you like, to describe the phenomena of accelerating expansion of the universe. Uh, it's not really a direct form of energy, like radiation is energy or light is energy. It's not any form of energy that we're familiar with, because we don't know in physics of anything that can cause space-time itself to expand. And where there's more space-time created, there's more dark energy causing it to expand even more. And that's how you have an accelerating expansion. So dark energy is, a, is an enigmatic entity in the universe at the moment. Craig Webb, who's on with us live, asks, uh, can you talk about what the latest is with Planet Nine? So Planet Nine is a hypothetical planet. Uh, we call it number nine because, in part because Pluto was demoted to a dwarf planet a few decades ago. So Planet Nine is the idea of a pluto size or larger planet that is yet undiscovered in the solar system. Some people believe this planet could be in a close-in orbit to the sun, perhaps on the opposite side of the sun from the Earth, uh, such as that we can't see it. That's very hard to sustain because gravitationally we'd still see its effects. So the idea of a planet nine close to the sun has pretty much been ruled out. Planet nine, or a large undiscovered planet in the outer solar system, is still on the table because the Kuiper Belt, a region of rocky material uh, and some dwarf planets, a number, half a dozen dwarf planets that rival Pluto in size, extends from about 40 astronomical units to 80. And, and that is a not fully explored region of space yet because those objects are far from the sun and therefore very dark and hard to detect. So Planet Nine in the outer solar system has not been ruled out, but it pretty much has been ruled out at the level of something, uh, say, Earth-sized. Uh, at Planet Nine in the outer solar system might be Pluto-sized or maybe twice the size of Pluto, but not much bigger than that. Otherwise, we would have already seen it. The next question is from John Graham, who's on with us live. It's been stated that we use a ratio of the half-lives of radioactive isotopes to date our solar system. Uh, but aren't those just dating of when some distant uh, star went supernova and created the elements initially? So age dating the solar system depends on understanding when radioactive material was fixed in a medium. Uh, radioactive dating, you know, depends on a couple of assumptions. It's not an absolute technique. It depends on knowing when a radioactive isotope um, was trapped in a medium 
ideally two different radioactive isotopes with different half-lives because then you can do a differential measurement were trapped in a medium as it condensed and the rock say became solid if it was a planet like the earth um, if that material originated from beyond the solar system and was radioactive then it's already of course it's been decaying over time so all you can measure is the age since it first formed in a fixed medium or a rock but that method is pretty reliable and as I said even more reliable if you have two isotopes in play because then you can sort of use one to cross check the other. Well, the next question is from Matt Webb who sent an email. The JWST discovered six galaxies that formed just 900 million years after the Big Bang. How do you think these galaxies formed in such a short amount of time? It's a puzzle in some degree that JWST is finding very massive, well-formed early galaxies, but it's not uh, a violation of current cosmology. Uh, you know, 900 million years is quite a long time. It's only 8 or 7 percent of the age of the universe, but it's quite a long time. And there are fluctuations of density in the early universe that eventually form structure. And there, it's a spectrum of fluctuations, a spectrum of scale of fluctuations in their, in their mass amplitude. And so it is expected in the entire universe that there will be some regions where the initial mass fluctuation is high, and so the object that formed will be quite massive. And then the process of gravitational collapse is an accelerating process. Once you form an initial perturbation or slight overdensity, it reaches a certain point uh, roughly a 50% over density relative to the background, and then it accelerates at an accelerating space. That means the formation of an object by gravitational collapse can happen quite quickly. Building a fully fledged galaxy with the architecture of a spiral galaxy, that does take some time too. But there's nothing about these processes as we simulate them in computers that suggests that it couldn't happen in the amount of time. Uh, to the redshift of these objects seen by JWST. It's just that these do have to be quite exceptional objects. They have to have formed in slightly unusual, but not anomalous, parts of the universe. Dan Cooper is on with us live and asks, are you familiar with the work being done at Caltech to beam electricity collected from solar panels in space back to the Earth? Uh, is this technology scalable anytime soon? I've read one article, I think, on these experiments. Um, there are a set of people, there are some countries actually working on this at the level in the European system. There are national level projects trying to do this too. So there are various ideas of taking uh, solar collectors and putting them in Earth orbit and then beaming microwaves back down to Earth for use by humans. So this is yet another way of breaking our energy dependence on fossil fuels with renewable energy sources. Uh, uh, the idea of s solar energy collection in orbit is that it's immune from all the problems you have with solar panels on the Earth due to the Earth's weather, due to the day-night cycle. Solar panels in orbit uh, are always active, always getting sunlight, and there's nothing in between them and the sun. Um, the beaming of the radiation down to Earth, which is the technology that Caltech scientists are working on particularly, that's a tricky part because you're dealing with quite high energy concentrations. And so the question becomes, how do you collect it, concentrate it, and then how do you actually convert it into a usable form at the end? Because an, a highly concentrated microwave energy beam is going to create a temperature that's hot enough to melt all materials. So it's actually quite a challenge of how you harness that beam down energy and turn it into electricity. The next question is from uh, let's see, Anthony, who's on with us live. Will we be able to see the Big Bang if we use a telescope to see farther than 14 billion light years, even though the universe is expanding at the speed of light? Um, if not, how far can we really see? We can't really see the Big Bang with a telescope um, because as we look further out we are looking back in time and the limit of our vision for radiation is essentially the microwave background radiation because that's before that the universe was opaque to radiation. Um, that's the curtain raising of the universe if you like. Everything was a fog before then. 
And so that day, that time is 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And for radiation of any kind, there's no way to see further back, essentially because the universe was not transparent. So there's no space to look through before that time. To look before that time, the most clever strategy actually involves neutrinos. If we got better capability of looking at neutrinos, they travel through space essentially unimpeded. Uh, they interrupt, they're, they're not interrupted by solid matter, they don't interact with radiation. And we do have neutrino telescopes. Uh, so in principle, we get a lot closer to the Big Bang with neutrinos, but that field is a young field, and the detector technology is nothing like as advanced as our telescope and optical technology. David McKenzie sent an email asking, uh, good morning to you all. What advances will the ESO's extremely large telescope and the giant Magellan telescope bring to astronomy? And will older telescopes become obsolete when these large advanced telescopes come online? So in addition to the, the two named, the European Extremely Large Telescope and the Giant Magellan Telescope, there's the 30 meter telescope that Caltech and the University of California are trying to build on Mauna Kea. So there are three huge telescopes all under construction or in preparation. And they're going to impact in all fields of astronomy. They, they will be general purpose telescopes, as the Hubble Space Telescope was, and the James Webb, doing studying stars, studying planets, studying galaxies, doing cosmology. Those three will do the same set of pieces of science. I would say that the killer app, if you like, for all these telescopes is going to be looking for life on Earth-like planets near in the nearby galaxy, because they will have the technology to sniff the atmospheres of those planets for life cre uh, microbes that have changed the atmospheres and therefore impute life on those planets. They will also look at the early universe in ways that even the Hubble and the James Webb can't, but just because of their sheer collecting area. They have 10, 20, 30 times more light gathering power, even the James Webb, which is a pretty big telescope, six and a half meters. So they are going to impact cosmology and exoplanet studies dramatically, but they will also impact other fields of astronomy. Uh, the next question is from Mary, who sent an email. Uh, it seems to me that the observation of gravitational waves could potentially cheat uncertainty. I had understood that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle um, stems from the wave particle duality of the photon. Is there a fundamental theoretical principle that forbids a workaround to uncertainty in observation? Um, you know, since gravitational waves themselves are then detected by lasers, which are photons, like how does this, uh, how, how does that kind of detection work around uncertainty? The Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which applies at the root level of physical reality according to physics, applies to the work of gravitational wave detectors. Uh, but in fact, it doesn't impede them. It's not a limitation on how they work. Um, the f basic uh, instrument behind gravitational wave detection is, a, is an interferometer, a Michelson interferometer. So it's a, it's a way of uh, looking at the coherent interference of light waves, and again, interference is a quantum phenomena of light. Um, and so quantum uncertainty is built into the effect of interference fringes and interference patterns of detecting uh, a small wavelength or path length shift in the two arms of the detector for gravitational waves like LIGO. Uh, and so quantum uncertainty is not a, a wild card or a limitation in this experiment. It's, it's part of the construct because you're using a principle of interferometry. Um, the next question is from one of our live participants. Um, let's see here. Sorry, I lost the question that I was going to grab. Um, Oh, um, Kaniz Fatima asks, can you talk a little bit about how asteroids, planets, and stars form? Um, asteroids, planets, and stars form from the same material. There's a nebula, which is just a large diffuse region of gas and dust uh, that's part of a galaxy of some kind, usually. Um, and it's a big enough region and mass 
that it will not form a single star. So stars do not form singly. They form in, in large groups or concentrations. The sun was, did have companions when it formed. Those companions have since drifted away as the spiral galaxy has rotated. And so you're in a region that will form hundreds, maybe at least tens and maybe hundreds and potentially thousands of stars all at once. And within that collapsing gas cloud, a star forms. And surrounding that star is material with angular momentum that will collapse into planets. And the smaller rocky debris left over forms things like asteroids. Excellent. Uh, the next question is from one of our live participants, uh, Demetrius asks, are there any chance, or is there any chance, even a slight chance, that Pluto and Neptune could collide um, as their orbits uh, sort of overlap or intersect, um, or do their resonances completely exclude this possibility? So the resonances of outer planets, including Pluto and Neptune, uh, if they have crossing orbits, uh, do Im do affect the calculation of their trajectories. They don't, in and of themselves, lead to an increased probability of collision. Um, the basic fact is that the, the volumes of space in the outer solar system are so large and the planets are so small compared to the distance between them that the odds of a collision, even if you play forward hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of orbits, are extremely low. And so in a computer, you can work out the probability of a collision in the outer solar system as well as we know their current trajectories. And then there's uncertainty attached to that, of course. Uh, and it does not suggest any significant probability of a collision for tens or hundreds of millions of years. Uh, the next question is from Afshan, who asks, uh, sent an email. Can you explain the significance of gravitational lensing in observational astronomy and its role in studying distant galaxies? Uh, gravitational lensing is a very powerful tool for studying the distant universe and distant galaxies. Um, because it's using all the information you can get where mass bends light. Uh, that means that you're studying all the matter, not just the visible stuff, and that we know the dark matter exceeds normal matter, conventional matter, by a factor of six. So gravitational lensing essentially allows you to map out the mass distribution of individual galaxies, if you have a particular lensing experiment or geometry, of clusters of galaxies, if you have the uh, little arcs that are formed by the cluster lensing geometry, and of even intergalactic space where the undulating paths of light and photons through dark matter filled regions of the intergalactic space uh, lead to slight distortions in the shapes of background galaxies. So these are all three different scales, three different effects, and they let gravitational lensing become a very important tool, essential tool, for mapping out the universe. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. The final question um, is going to be from the Black Hole Girl, uh, who's on with us live. What is the current state of research on the search for extraterrestrial life? How are scientists using technology to identify potentially habitable exoplanets? The search for extraterrestrial life is going very well. It's a very interesting stage because there's a sense that it will happen. The first detection could happen in the within a decade. The primary tools for sensing life on an exoplanet are spectroscopic. Uh, you take an Earth-type planet or a super-Earth perhaps, and there are many super-Earths, more than there are Earth-like planets. Uh, you block out the parent star, you spread the reflected light of the planet, which is hundreds of millions or billions of times fainter, into a spectrum, and you look for global alteration of the atmosphere by biology. In the Earth's example, that would be oxygen and ozone. They're telltales of biology since they were created by microbes. Uh, the oxygen we breathe was put there billions of years ago by microbes, and the same would be true on another planet. You can also look for methane-based life, um, where the me metabolic, metabolic process is not photosynthesis, but is something based on methane. So there are different biosignatures or biomarkers that impute into a spectrum of an exoplanet, and this is the tool that is very likely to lead to success in the next five to ten years. 
Thanks for all the good questions, covering a lot of ground as always, and uh, I think we have a one on the books that Matthew can remind us the next date, but I think we're a couple of weeks from now we have one on the books. One more, I think, perhaps before Christmas. Actually, there are two more. So two more. there's one on November 30th is the next one, and then the uh, one after that will be two weeks later in December. Um, so check your emails for those. Um, and also at the very top of the uh, chat, there's a link. So if you are not currently a member of our uh, one of our courses, you can uh, join the Google group and we will send out an email um, uh, announcement about all of our live sessions from there. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. We will see you again in two weeks uh, on November 30th. Um, we hope you have a great rest of your week and a good weekend. We'll see you then.